five questionable physics Nobel Prizes that left everyone thinking, what exactly were the Nobel people thinking when they made this decision? Don't forget to like and subscribe. At number five, guano. In 1978, Penzias and Wilson got a Nobel Prize for, well, not for discovering guano. Actually, at the time, there was a debate between competing theories as to the origins of the universe. One of these theories was the Big Bang Theory. And physicists Ralph Alpher and Robert Herman noticed that if the Big Bang is correct, then there should be a sort of afterglow of the initial light of the Big Bang, and today we should observe the remnants of this afterglow called the cosmic microwave background radiation. That is to say, a very weak radio signal that looks like white noise, sort of like the static on old televisions. Well, three physicists, Robert Dickey, Jim Peebles, and Dave Wilkinson set out to find this background radio signal. They built a very sensitive radio receiver. However, look as they may, they couldn't find it. Coincidentally, about an hour away, Penzias and Wilson, working for Bell Labs, built a similar hypersensitive radio receiver for a completely unrelated purpose. They were trying to detect very faint radio signals coming off of weather balloons or something like that. And they noticed that they kept getting noise in their signal. Originally they thought it's because the antenna was dirty, that pigeons were hanging out inside the antenna, and so it was filled with pigeon droppings, and that this was causing the noise in their signal. But they kept cleaning the antenna, and the noise didn't go away. At one point, they mentioned this to a physicist friend of theirs, who realized this kind of sounds like this cosmic microwave background radiation that these three other guys down the road were looking for. And sure enough, it turns out Penzias and Wilson had accidentally found it, for which they got the Nobel Prize in 1978. Now this is a bit odd because they weren't even looking for it, and when they found it, they didn't even know what it was. If anything, Alpha and Herman should have got the Nobel Prize. They actually predicted it, and the three guys that set out to look for it didn't find it, and the people who did find it literally thought it was bird crap. If you're enjoying this video so far, please just take a second to like and subscribe, maybe share it with a few friends. At number four, we have Scotch Tape, or more precisely, Scotch Tape and a Lead Pencil. In 2004, Gayem and Novoselov got the Nobel Prize, quite literally for sticking pieces of tape on graphite. You see, at the time, graphene was all the rage. And graphene is just a very thin, one atom thick layer of graphite. And Gayem and Novoselov realized that they could actually make graphene by just sticking pieces of tape onto a piece of graphite and peeling it off. And this would give them a very thin layer of graphite and they would repeat the process until they had a very thin layer of graphite. It's only a wafer thin. Maybe just a few atoms thick. Now, I'm sure Gaim and Novoselov are perfectly competent physicists, but is this really the greatest accomplishment in physics the Nobel Committee could find in 2004? At number three, we have Little Green Men. In 1974, Hewish and Ryle got a Nobel Prize for a paper they wrote with Hewish's grad student, Jocelyn Bell. The three of them were part of a team that had spent two years building a telescope array, and when it was finally online, Jocelyn Bell found a very strange signal of light blips flashing at a very regular interval. She went to her advisor Hewish about this, who initially didn't believe her, that'll come into play later on in the story, and eventually they published this paper, not knowing what they had found. They called it Little Green Man 1 because, sort of as half of a joke that maybe this is an alien civilization trying to communicate with us, they didn't really believe it, but it was a possibility as what in nature is going to produce these very regular flashing lights. Well, a few years later, it turned out they figured out this was actually what's called a pulsar, which is a rotating neutron star. Neutron stars have these very bright radiation beams emitting from their poles, and as it spins, if it's sort of pointed towards you, you'll see these intermittent flashing lights at a very regular rate. So, turned out it wasn't an alien. But it was still an important discovery, perfectly deserving of a Nobel Prize. So everything was fine. Enter physicist Fred Hoyle. Hoyle was a guy with a somewhat brash personality who had a reputation of going around and accusing people of stealing other people's work or other academic, shall we say, faux pas. And he mentioned sort of offhandedly in an interview that actually it was Jocelyn Bell who found this signal and not Hewish and Ryle despite the fact that they got the Nobel Prize for it suggesting that they stole her discovery, or at the very least, that she should have been included in the Nobel Prize. Well, this remark caused a huge kerfuffle, 
in which Hoyle found himself being sued for libel. By the way, Bell was asked of her opinion that she was not including the Nobel Prize, and she stated that it was normal because she was a grad student and typically the Nobel Prize is not given to grad students unless they do something truly extraordinary. Now, did she actually believe this or was she just playing the politics game? If you've ever been in academia, you'll know that social politics is the name of the game and one little mishap can ruin your reputation. So now Hoyle, in order to get around this lawsuit he was facing, wrote a big piece explaining himself in a newspaper in which he basically dumped all the blame onto the Nobel Committee, saying the whole thing was their screw-up. As a result of this, Bell became somewhat of a poster child for injustices in academia towards grad students and women. What's strange here is that this was dumped on the Nobel Committee. For one, it's true that they rarely give Nobel Prizes to grad students, and as far as giving it to women, well, the third Nobel Prize in Physics was given to a woman, and the first person in history to be given two Nobel Prizes was also a woman. Incidentally, it was the same woman, Marie Curie. So the Nobel Committee's history seems to demonstrate they have no problem giving a prize to a woman. Doesn't really seem like the Nobel Committee did anything wrong here. The same, it turns out, may not be said for Hewish and Ryle, whose behavior in the matter was, shall we say, less than exemplary. At least, if we're to believe Jocelyn Bell's account of the events as she later stated that when she first came to Hewish with this signal, he was very dismissive of what she had found and he didn't believe her and kept telling her this is just noise, it's some human-made signal. But in the meantime, he was discussing this signal with Ryle in meetings in which Bell was not invited. And then when he finally accepted that Bell had found something, he put himself as the first author on the paper. Now that's not actually that unusual for the grad student to not be given first name on the paper, but it's somewhat understood that the good and honest professor will put their grad students first if the grad students did most of the work. Now to be fair, these are Jocelyn Bell's accounts of the events, and I've never actually heard Hewish and Ryle's side of the story. But assuming Bell's accounts are true, is it reasonable to expect the Nobel Committee to know what had taken place behind closed doors? They only saw a paper with Hewish as the first author. But thanks to Hoyle, the blame was initially dumped on them. Which it seems they did not take too kindly to, as a decade later, Fred Hoyle's work was given a Nobel Prize, but Fred Hoyle was not included as one of the recipients. In 1983, Chandrasekhar and Fowler got a Nobel Prize for their contributions to understanding the various stages in stellar evolution. By the way, if you're interested in learning how stars work, I have an entire series on stellar evolution, which I invite you to check out. Now Chandrasekhar is not really part of this story, but Fowler's work was done entirely with Fred Hoyle, and yet only he was included in the prize. You see, at the time there was a big problem with how is carbon made in the universe. Nobody could figure it out. The best theory they had was what's called the triple alpha process, in which three alpha particles, or helium nuclei, come together and make carbon. The problem was nobody could figure out how to make this work. Well, Fred Hoyle had a model for how this would happen in stars, but it required that there was a very specific energy level in carbon just at the right place. But the energy levels of carbon were already known, and it wasn't there. So Hoyle went to see Fowler, who was an experimental nuclear physicist, and said, you guys screwed up, you missed this all-important energy level. So Fowler's team went looking for it, and sure enough, they found it. And this energy level is now famously called the Hoyle state. If you'd like to know more about the triple alpha process and the history of this discovery, I have an entire video on it. So Fowler was awarded the prize for finding this Hoyle state, but the guy who predicted it, Fred Hoyle, was not included. By the way, it wasn't actually Fowler who found it, it was his grad student Ward Whaling who took on the project, and he did not get the Nobel Prize. So we see again that the Nobel Committee generally does not give prizes to grad students. And to be clear here, I am no way saying, and nobody has ever said, that Fowler was not deserving of the prize. He was absolutely key in finding this Hoyle state, but Fowler himself could not believe that Hoyle was not included. And really the only explanation for this is that the Nobel Committee had taken it personally that Hoyle had thrown them under the bus 10 years before. Finally, at number one, the most questionable physics Nobel Prize decision, Einstein doesn't get a Nobel Prize? How can this be? Oh, it be. Wait a minute, you say. Einstein did get a Nobel Prize in 1921. That's true, but not for what you think. He got it for explaining the photoelectric effect. This is a process in which if you shine light onto a metal surface, it can eject electrons. The problem was 
the way the electrons were being ejected didn't fit with the wave theory of light. And Einstein said, well actually this can be explained if light is a particle. And then everything worked fine. The wave theory of light was wrong. This was a key step in the development of the theory of quantum mechanics, which Einstein, by the way, didn't believe in. And I'm not saying this didn't deserve a Nobel Prize, but of all the things Einstein did, this was hardly his greatest accomplishment. The same year he came out with his paper on the photoelectric effect, he introduced the world to his theory of special relativity. Time and distances are relative. Different observers moving relative to one another will have clocks that turn at different rates. Time is not absolute, and the distances they measure will also be different. This was a major revolution in physics, and it resulted in Einstein completely rewriting Newton's laws of motion. Newton's laws were wrong. If that wasn't enough, he actually wrote two papers that year on special relativity, the second one introducing the most famous equation in all of physics, E equals mc squared, mass equals energy, another major revolution in the history of physics. And yet, Apparently, this didn't deserve a Nobel Prize, but the photoelectric effect did. Ten years later, Einstein introduces the theory of general relativity. Gravity, it turns out, is not a force, but the result of the curvature of space and time. His theory predicted that light would actually be affected by gravity in that you could observe the deflection of light if it passed by a strong gravitational field. It also solved the problem with Mercury's orbit. You see, Newton's law of gravity worked fine with all the planets, but for some reason, something was a little bit off with Mercury's orbit. It didn't quite fit, and nobody could figure it out. Well, Einstein's new theory of gravity actually explained this. Problem solved. Not only were Newton's laws wrong, but Newton's theory of gravity was also wrong. Einstein is in, Newton is out. And in fact, it made all sorts of predictions that over the last hundred years have continued to be verified. And yet, this theory didn't get a Nobel Prize either. He didn't get gypped once, he got gypped twice. I mean, what was the Nobel Committee thinking? If neither of these theories are deserving of a Nobel Prize, what is the criteria for winning the Nobel Prize? And it's not like they just ran out of time, because the Nobel Prize is only given to people who are alive, but Einstein died in the 50s. They had 40 years to give him the prize. He should have won three Nobel Prizes, at least. This is the greatest oversight in award history. This is like if for 40 years you had an entire team of astronomers looking at the sky, trying to figure out how the solar system works, and over that entire 40 years, every single one of them collectively forget to include the sun and the moon in their model. They're literally the two biggest things in the sky, and somehow they completely forget about them you really have to wonder what on earth was going on in the Nobel Committee for those 40 years. So that's my list of five questionable physics Nobel Prizes. Let me know what you think in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, you might enjoy this next video on the top 10 physicists who changed our lives. Please be sure to like and subscribe and hit the bell to be notified for future physics videos. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.